Welcome to this third installment in the Core 100 Lecture Series. My name is uh, Professor Fulkerson. I teach in, uh, philosophy. And today I will be talking on dangerous ideas, some intellectual footholds. So I'll just give you maybe a minute more. Okay. When I hear the word danger, the first thing that comes to my mind is an old TV series, Lost in Space. This sci-fi sitcom, rebooted in recent uh, years in Netflix, follows a family of space travelers who are stranded on an unfamiliar planet. Within the family, there is a special relationship between a young boy and his intelligent robotic friend. In, si in certain situations, the robot alerts, Danger, Will Robinson, danger. Since the inception of this sitcom in the 1960s, the silly phrase has had strange staying power, appearing in many other shows and movies, including, among others, The West Wing, The Gilmore Girls, The Simpsons, and The Jamie Foxx Show. You don't need to know anything about the show to have some sense of what the robot might mean. On the surface, the idea is some, of something being dangerous is so obvious to our human experience that it re hardly requires reflection. Perhaps this is part of the reason that Lost in Space's little jingle has had such staying power. It expresses this most common of human experiences and even allows us to laugh a little without totally making light of life's difficult situations. If we were to ask you, if I were to ask you how you would define danger, what would you write? Merriam-Webster defines danger as exposure or liability to injury pain, harm, or loss. Cambridge Dictionary similarly defines danger as the possibility of harm or death or something unpleasant happening. Is this close to what you were thinking? While there might be some reason to tweak some things, at least initially, these seem like pretty clear and uncontroversial definitions. Would you agree? We'll have opportunity to revisit these definitions a little later, but our topic today isn't merely about danger but about dangerous ideas. What exactly is a dangerous idea? How can an immaterial thing be dangerous? Recalling another jingle from my childhood, I was taught, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Have you heard this? Do you agree? Do words and ideas hurt? It seems to me that current sentiments have changed. We're inclined to believe that ideas can and do hurt. But then, what exactly do we mean by this? Are ideas, and are, are ideas dangerous and hurtful in the same way as sticks and stones? Or do we mean something different? Additionally, if they truly are dangerous, then why, unlike physical dangers, do we not find such ready at hand awareness of what this danger might involve and how we should respond to it? Today's talk is about dangerous ideas. In a moment, I'll tell you a little more about the background of this talk and how it relates to your class in this series. But first, let me point you toward where we're going. Specifically, I'd like to highlight two abiding convictions in this talk, which direct our attention toward the end of education and what I think is at stake in dangerous ideas. First, we must recognize what is implicit in the idea of danger, namely, the goodness of life. We cannot understand danger without first understanding life. So while our talk will be about danger and dangerous ideas, it is more fundamentally about life. Second, when thinking about human life, we also need to attend to the priority of the soul over the body. Please hear me correctly. I did not say to the neglect of the body. Rather, to speak of the prior priority of the soul is to say something about the kinds of earthly creatures we are. It is to say, it is to call our human bodies into more significant form of being. As I'll show, our common language already presupposes this. Cumulatively, 
This talk is ultimately about flourishing in Christ and doing so not by avoiding danger, but through it. We'll proceed by thinking about our lives and the accompanying danger at different levels of being. First, thinking about our vegetative life, then animal life, and finally, ending with what is unique about human life. So first then, let's begin with developing the background of today's talk. It's actually one of five talks in this new Core 100 series intended to provide some orientation to life and learning here at Dort. But why, you might ask, include a talk about dangerous ideas, whatever that phrase might mean? What could be so fundamental and orienting that this talk should be included among the others? To answer this question, we need to distinguish the two major ideas in today's talk, danger and ideas. Ideas relates to the life of the soul, intellect and will, mind and heart. The forming of the soul is and always has been at the center of education. This is why the Kuiperian tradition has been steadfast in its commitment to Christian education. As plants require good soil to grow, so human growth and learning happen in good educational soil. To speak of ideas, or at least well-cultivated ideas, is to speak about knowledge and learning. It is to attend to the flourishing of the soul. This is the essence of education, and thus also the core of university life. While university education may be about more than ideas, it is not less. We cannot talk about study, or scholarship, or serviceable insights or wisdom, without also talking about ideas, the forming of human minds and knowledge. But today's topic also has a situational component. It's intended to respond to some immediate challenges that we face, which are also hindrances to our educational environments. This is captured in the adjective dangerous. The background of this talk is the wider intellectual climate of our culture, which we can't and don't leave behind when we arrive at the university. But what exactly is a dangerous idea, and why use it to describe our current situation? I can begin by saying that a certain judgment about our situation preceded the planning committee's naming of it. And what, you ask, is that judgment? Dangerous ideas expresses the sentiment that certain topics are off-limits of conversation. Of course, they're not formally prohibited, but trepidly avoided and danced around. We don't like to or want to talk about them. One way to think about these dangerous ideas might focus on the topics that seem to be off-limits. What are dangerous ideas? Answer, controversial topics. This seems to be what Wired Magazine means by dangerous ideas, which dedicated a theme edition to the topic in 2009. As you may be able to read, some of the dangerous or controversial topics included human cloning, purging the prisons, and abolishing the NFL. Today, we might talk about defunding the police or transgender athletes, among others. Moreover, what counts as controversial will vary from community to community. For some, talking about race and racism is controversial. In other circles, questioning that narrative is equally controversial. Topics like global warming, capitalism and government regulation, social justice, and evolution, among others, seem to be increasingly controversial, and charitable and informed disagreement is correspondingly sparse. Minimally, to speak of dangerous ideas is to identify the topics that are considered controversial. But this can't be the whole story. It's not merely that some topics are controversial or even difficult, but also that we're reluctant to talk about these topics, or at least not until we're confident about the company that we keep. We should ask ourselves why. The answer to this question is undoubtedly larger than today's talk. I'm pursuing the question more modestly by the prompt of our title, Dangerous Ideas. Dangerous ideas connotes more than controversial or debated. Specifically, it carries all that is connoted in the idea of danger. One, pos one possible elaboration is the connection with fear, and especially the exhortation not to be afraid. As will become clear, I ultimately find this unpersuasive, but considering it is nonetheless instructive. In this sense, dangerous ideas seems to connote a sort of virtue, 
what we might call courageous, excuse me, courageous curiosity, along with a corresponding vice, what we might call oppressive timidity. It's not the ideas that are dangerous, but the avoidance of them. Take, for example, Daniel Dennett's book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. Dennett is an outspoken atheistic evolutionist, not to be confused with theistic evolution or evolutionary creationism. When he speaks of Darwin's dangerous idea, he's talking about Darwin's courage to confront human humanity's meaningless place in the cosmos. According to Dennett, for example, Darwin was willing to explain away the minds and purposes and meanings that we all, that we all hold dear. Alternatively, he was opposed, uh, those opposed to the idea were defensive religious yearning, a desire to protect and restore our place in the cosmos. So understood, the referent of dangerous idea is only an apparent danger, and in fact the truth. And the real danger lies with those unwilling to embrace the supposed truth of this new idea. The real danger is the danger of a closed mind, which is the characteristic of all those who supposedly cling to old beliefs and unwillingly, who are unwilling to confront the truth of new ideas. That is, those who tarnish the new idea with the moniker dangerous in order to avoid the truth that they prefer not to consider. We find a similar, if less belligerent, sense of dangerous ideas in Alistair McGrath's book, Christianity's Dangerous Idea. The book is an account of Protestantism's decentralizing of the church. He calls it Christianity's idea rather than Protestantism's idea because he takes the idea to be true. But he calls it dangerous because it's subversive to and thus resisted by the power structures of the time. Again, dangerous idea refers to the truthful idea held by some but suppressed by others not because they're actually dangerous, false, or harmful, but because those people's investment in the status quo. If those who affirm the novel idea are courageously curious, then we're also asked to see that those who resist it are oppressively timid. However different Dennett's and McGrath's arguments may be, they have surprisingly a common account of dangerous ideas. In both cases, the dangerous idea is not, in fact, dangerous or to be avoided but that which is sought after and affirmed. One is left wondering whether there is such a thing as a dangerous idea, or whether any ideas are really to be feared or avoided. It seems to me that this fits more with modern notions of curiosity, which confuse what the ancients, pagan and Christian alike, would have distinguished, namely the virtue of studiousness and the vice of curiosity. All pursuits of knowledge are not equal, Studiousness is a virtue of intellect that pursues knowledge in the right way, at the right time, for the right reasons. Curiosity, on the other hand, is an ill-directed search for knowledge, pursuing the wrong questions, at the wrong time, in the wrong way, for the wrong reasons. Without this sense of curiosity, virtue and vice are confused, and all new ideas are good ideas. Very Well Mind, an online psycholog psychology journal, actually speaks of xenophobia, a fear of new ideas as a psychological condition. Such fear, it says, halts progress and can make it difficult for people to accept new ideas and change. As a culture, it seems to me, we're amazingly tolerant of reckless ideas. Most of us won't skydive or, ro or rock climb, and for, reasons, and for similar reasons, activities like motorcycling uh, and smoking are taboo. But kick around ideas of atheism or cosmopolitan's insights about sexuality, all the power to you. I wonder if this betrays some deep confusion about how God has created us, what makes for a flourishing human life. In any case, contra the way that McGrath and Dennett use dangerous ideas, it seems to me that the most obvious and indeed the most, uh, the most obvious and indeed the most important sense of dangerous ideas is also the most matter of fact. Namely, dangerous ideas are dangerous. They are ideas that have the potential to harm. What remains for us to explore is how ideas can be harmful. 
As I already suggested, I'd like to do that in two ways. First, by thinking about that which precedes danger, namely life. And second, by thinking about life between body and soul. Turning then to the topic of life, let's begin by thinking about what's called vegetative life, which is partially analogous, but not, but not only analogous, to human life. Frequently, when we, believe, when we attempt to visualize human flourishing, we turn to images of plants and trees, the simplest form of vegetative life. Consider, for example, the cover of these books on human flourishing. However different these covers or the words within them may be, they all share one thing in common. Flourishing is represented by the way of a plant life. Why? I suspect if there are a few answers. One is that we know what a flourishing plant looks like. Even Jesus draws on the plant imagery, both when he curses the fig tree that bears no fruit and in his parable of the seeds scattered in different soil. Another answer seems to be that, through the plants, we see something for which we long. But also, I wonder, whether the dominance of the vegetative images suggests a more abiding confusion about our own flourishing, and thus also the dangers that thwart it. Might we long for what we see in plants, but feel lacking in ourselves, and unable to adequately articulate? The Im image of a plant is more than analogous because we share some characteristics, ca some characteristics of life with plants. Notably, our lives require nourishment. They mature or grow over time, and they have some presumed end or purpose. They blossom and bear fruit. Notice how common this language is to us. Humans hunger and thirst. We speak of children as growing up and blossoming. With this first sense of life, we also have a sense of danger. The most significant way that vegetative life is threatened is by malnourishment. Oh, where am I at here? Sorry about that. Malnourishment means badly nourished. It is a lack or excess of proper nutrients, which may happen acutely or gradually. In extreme starvation, a plant withers and dies. More modestly, more modest, more modest lack leads not to death, but to floundering, failing to grow properly and not bearing fruit. With the former, we might think of drought, and with the latter, insufficient daily sunlight. We know these plant experiences. Moreover, whereas starvation is an example of lack, we're also familiar with excess. Flooding might drown a plant or extreme exposure to sun scorch it. We might also think of words like poison and toxicity, concerned as they are with digesting things not good for particular living things. Malnourishment results either in instant withering or slow floundering. While plants experience this in unique ways, nourishment is an attribute of all living things. This vegetative part of the human refers to our actual bodies. When our bodies are alive, for example, but our cognitive abilities have ceased, we call this a vegetative state. In some parts of the world, lack of food remains a real problem. Similarly, for many communities, poison, pollution, and toxicity, all of which are problems of nourishment, are serious threats. With our focus on dangerous ideas, notice how fundamental this vocabulary is for the way that we think about our own flourishing, which includes the body, but also exceeds it. Just listen to the vocabulary hungering and thirsting, toxic, poisonous, starved, drought, flood, drowning, withering. We sometimes call people toxic, or we speak of seasons of drought. When Jesus speaks of hungering and thirsting, its object is not food, but righteousness. This doesn't mean that vegetative life doesn't matter. Rather, it means that the end and purpose of a human life is more than mere bodies. This is why many societies associate maturity not with the spry body of a 20 or 30-year-old, but rather with gray hair. That is, with a mature soul, with wisdom and understanding. If we're going to grow and bear fruit, this suggests that our soul must be well-nourished. I suspect that there are many, many ways that the metaphor can be explored, 
and I encourage you to do so in your discussions. But at this point, I'd like to return to our narrower topic of dangerous ideas. Following the image of vegetative life and nourishment, dangerous ideas would presumably be all forms of malnourishment, excess or deficient, gradual or acute, that hinder a flourishing life. So are there ideas so malnourishing that we must avoid them? Perhaps a more important and prior question is this. What ideas are nourishing? Thinking about dangerous ideas within the context of the gospel and the Christian life, I see three basic principles. First, like food, the kinds of ideas we consume will have a direct bearing upon our health, for good or for bad. The second two follow from this. Second, negatively, this means that some ideas we consume may be malnourishing. If not poisonous, then at least not good for us. Rather like our own physical health, it seems to me that we're perhaps attentive to poisonous ideas, but less attentive to junk food or other modest forms of malnourishment. Consider this example. Christians will sometimes affirm that we agree on the essentials, but disagree on the non-essentials. On the surface, there's nothing wrong with this, but it's also, it also surprisingly conceals something important. Namely, it leaves underdetermined whether the essentials are actually nourishing us. If we affirm the essentials, but don't hunger and thirst for them, we might be more malnourished than we realize, striving for artificial light while hiding in the darkness. So, you might ask, am I suggesting that we withdraw from the world? Cease talking about all non-essential things? Moreover, am I suggesting that we shouldn't entertain questions and ideas other than the gospel, or that seem contrary to our own beliefs? By no means. In this negative point, I'm merely asking us to take seriously the question of nourishment. When plants have water in the earth available to them, they don't refuse it, waiting instead for a fresh rain. Only humans confuse such things. Augustine has famously said that our hearts are restless until they rest in God. We could paraphrase that vegetatively by saying that my soul is hunger, my soul is hungry until it finds satisfaction in God. Excuse me. Whoops, sorry. Uh, third, then, and finally, a well nourished soul has deep roots. Bodily speaking, we can't really preserve food, and this is even more true with water. But a nourished soul seems more like a tree. To be richly nourished is about more than daily consumption. It's also about the source of that consumption. And on this point, we could do well to recall the image of roots and depth that Professors Bailey and Dornboss developed in previous talks. I am the bread of life, said Jesus. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Or again, with the Nicene Creed, we confess that the Holy Spirit is the giver of life, and not only bodily life, but also the new and sanctified life. Psalm 1 explicitly and extensively draws upon the vegetative image, comparing the life of wisdom rooted in the word of God as a tree planted by streams of living water, yielding fruit in season and prospering in all that it does. Images of roots and depth contrast permanence, stability, and strength with inconsistency, instability, and vulnerability. These aren't generic affirmations, but rather qualities needed to sustain life through irregular seasons. Part of current cultural angst, it seems to me, is an instability in our identity as a people. It is not clear who we are or who we'll become. When the two prevailing options are opposed to one another, these are quite dangerous ideas. But in the midst of this momentary instability, we have a much deeper well-rooted stability. Life in Christ is not and will not change. However different the Reformed tradition may be from Catholics or Pentecostals, or its practices in America from Canada, South Korea, or Kenya, there is still something far more fundamental in common. Only when we are nourished on the source of life, this source of life, will we not be threatened by the barrenness of the land around us and the tumbleweed that blows about it. 
stated positively, we can only respond well to dangerous ideas if, like a tree planted by a stream, we are first nourished by a truly life-giving source. Let's turn now to animal life. Roots and depth are powerful images, connecting us to the past not easily shaken. Like a strong oak, we can sustain the most violent winds and prolonged droughts. But roots are also something restricted to plant life. Unlike plants, animals include movement. Whether giraffe, grasshopper, or human, animals are capable of changing place. Frequently, movement remains closely connected to nourishment. Some animals will migrate with the seasons, for example, changing places by flight or by foot. In other instances, animals move within a place in search of food, whether hunting prey or grazing upon different parts of the land. In addition to movement or locomotion, animal life has two other general capacities or attributes that are conducive to more complex forms of life, attributes about which we're personally familiar. Specifically, animals are sensory. They have ability to sense, to perceive, and to know things about their surroundings and they have appetite or desire. They go after some things and avoid others. At some instinctual level, these three capacities frequently work together. When a dog senses a rabbit by sight or by smell, it desires it and runs after it. When the rabbit senses the dog, it may freeze or pound its foot to notify other rabbits. And if the dog pursues, it will run. This added level of complexity also entails increased possibilities of both flourishing and floundering. To subsist, an animal must not only be able to nourish itself, but also to see and to hear and to walk. I'm no expert on animals. My colleagues in the life sciences could speak more competently on these matters. But at least this much seems clear. Animals, like plants, naturally tend towards life. But also, like plants, the life they seek does not exceed the bare persistence of life. However inclined, we may be, however inclined we may be to give our dogs Prozac, your Labrador will never long for the next-door poodle's doghouse. And, contra Chick-fil-A, cows have no preferences whether you eat beef or chicken. As we think about danger in relation to animal life, I'd like to especially call our attention to appetite which directs sense and locomotion in an effort to avoid danger. Whereas the acacia tree neither can nor wants to flee the encroaching giraffe, animals do sense and flee from danger. This happens naturally. The giraffe never says, the lion's too close, there's no point in running. Or perhaps, the years of my life were full and weary, I shall not run today. But the sense of danger arising from the ability to know and to flee, adds a level of our understanding of danger. Indeed, when we think about danger in relation to animal appetite, we, we find a weakness in the dictionary definitions. To recall, Merriam-Webster defines danger as exposure or liability to injury, pain, harm, or loss. Cambridge Dictionary defi similarly defines danger as the possibility of harm or death or something unpleasant happening. What, you might wonder, can possibly be wrong with these definitions? Don't they seem obviously correct? The problem is not what's said, but what's unsaid. Danger is more than the possibility of harm or the exposure to it. As our robotic friend reminds us, the warning is an essential part of the danger. Danger is not only about possibility, but also about anticipation and the desire to avoid. No, Will Robinson. Danger, the sense of danger, is attributed to animals with sense and appetite, living creatures who can perceive harm and desire to avoid it. Here again, we find rich vocabulary of words related to our own lives. And, there, and here they feel even closer to us. Walking is a common way to describe our course of life, as when Paul exhorts those alive in the Spirit to walk according to the Spirit. And we speak of ourselves as pilgrims, those on the move to a new place. 
We have a whole vocabulary related to our desire to avoid pain, harm, and even fleet and death. Fleet, protect, avoid. Like animals, we can sometimes freeze or hide, uh, become defensive or aggressive. And while our hair may not stand up and we don't bark, we do have visceral responses to the fear of danger. We can feel it in our hearts, in the temperature of our skin. Of course, no animal, of course, for animals, the fear of pain is the only physical pain, and there's no sense of regret, is, excuse me, is only physical pain, and there's no sense of regret. If a fox is caught in a trap, for example, it won't reflect upon the past and regret the path taken. But for humans, pain is more, both because it includes a rational dimension, things like shame, and because it's mixed with regret, a remembrance and recognition of all the ways that we were perhaps senseless or careless, or things that we could have done otherwise. There are many ways the metaphor can be explored. For example, I've mostly emphasized avoidance of harm, but notions of defense are more complex than this. Images of baiting and trapping are also closely related to the dynamic of the appetite. Creatures, creatures are baited into a trap by drawing them toward what they desire, while concealing what might otherwise repel them. As we turn to dangerous ideas within the context of the gospel and Christian life, the idea of baits and traps approaches where I'd like to draw our attention. Namely, we should attend to those places where the appetites are mixed, where seeking after and avoiding happen simultaneously. So again, if we consider three principles, the first and most basic is this. Fear, or the avoidance of harm and death, cannot determine the possibility of life. While avoiding harm is good, it is not the highest good. Life cannot be lived merely by avoiding death and pain. If we look too closely at the proximate danger, we might fail to see the greater good beyond the danger. To live in fear is not to truly live, because the end or purpose of life is not determined by what is avoided, but what is pursued. If this is true of animals who seek nourishment, it's even more true of humans who seek much more than food. So on the one hand, we cannot let fear determine our course, and on the other, we need to be aware of the good or purpose of the life to which we seek. When we talk about virtue and character, it's this proper assessment of and response to danger that is called courage. Courage is a mean between two extremes in relation to danger. On the one hand, the foolhardy person rushes heedlessly and carelessly into danger without consideration of the good sought. On the other hand, the timid person knows the good desired but shrinks back because the, of the fear of harm is too powerful. Courage, alternatively, recognizes both the higher good and the immediate threat. While acting wise and discerning about the danger, this person's life nonetheless remains focused on the true good sought after. Earlier, I paraphrased the famous saying of Augustine to fit it within a vegetative uh, image. The phrase, as you may recall, pertains to the restless heart. Rest and restlessness are closer to appetite, and more specifically to the rational will. A restless heart is a heart in search of fulfillment. When we speak of the Christian life as a journey or a pilgrimage, we are invoking this searching, seeking image. And not, only, and, uh, not of any animals, but of rational animals. Still thinking about life as a mixed journey in search of fulfillment, while also avoiding harm, let me only briefly expand this metaphor with two additional principles, leaving for your discussions how to fill in the particulars. The first pertains to the path, and the second to the sojourners and travel, travel companions. Second, then, the path of faith is not devoid of obstacles. Our lives are often described as paths. The Psalms draw upon different images for paths, broad paths and narrow paths, Jesus, too, speaks of, of a wide and narrow gates. By their nature, paths are directive and orienting. They're going somewhere. And when you follow them, we have some sense of where we're going. Did you know that erring is also a journey image, not unrelated to being lost? 
To err is to wander. That is, to wander off the path. When we wander too far from the path, we become lost, possibly even unable to find our way back. But staying on the path doesn't mean that the path is easy. The Psalms will occasionally speak of the broad path as a safe path. And here again, I'm reminded of Professor Bailey's talk about the length and breadth and width of Christian faith. Experience also testifies to the safety that comes in broad paths and the ease of travel that accompanies it. But we're also familiar with narrow paths, seasons of life that don't allow our eyes to gaze upon the distant horizons, but require us to attend to each step immediately in front of us. I was recently talking with a student who realized that she is sometimes unable to defend her beliefs. She wondered, does this mean that her beliefs are wrong and that the other person, with better reasons, is correct? Or does it mean that she needs to better shore up her own beliefs? That is undoubtedly a scary question, a genuine obstacle on the path of faith. How should she respond? Of course, if our beliefs are indeed false, and not only false, but errantly false, leading us away from the path, then such alternative beliefs are are not necessarily dangerous, but possibly helpful and instructive. On the other hand, if they are truly dangerous beliefs, beliefs that lead us restlessly off the path, then these are dangerous ideas. But how are we to, to discern the difference? What sorts of intellectual skills do you think are required for safe travel along the intellectual journey of dangerous ideas. Third, safe travel requires trustworthy travel companions. Sometimes the path is broad, safe, and well-marked, but other times this is not the case. The surroundings may be strange, the danger is unknown. We are generally social creatures seeking love and friendship, but those friendships are all the more crucial in times of adversity. Trusted guides are critical, but so also are good friends. People with whom you, can, you, are, uh, you are together devoted on a common journey. This summer, while I was in Kenya, my daughters and I walked within 20 yards of a small pack of buffalo. Why approach creatures so much bigger and stronger than us, so able to maul us if they desired? The simple, somewhat childish answer is that we trusted our guide who knew the land before him and had complete confidence in the situation. Who are the guides that you can trust, living or dead? Of course, Jesus himself is our first guide. He calls us to follow him, and he shows us the path before us, one that requires us to carry our cross. We may also again hearken back to tradition, acknowledging our indebtedness to those brothers and sisters in the faith who had gone before us. But there are also living guides, Who are some of the guides that you trust? Who do you find less trustworthy and why? What are the qualities that you seek in those whom you trust that make them trustworthy? The company we keep is also important. When when you think about your friendships, to what extent do you see friendship not not merely about frivolity, idle play, but also something more essential to your own life and flourishing as well as theirs? Does it matter whether you are together on a common journey, a shared purpose and destination? What might it look like to think of friends as sojourners? And how might such sojourners, guides and friends alike, support us and we them as we together walk along the path that leads to the heavenly city? We've come at last to our final point, which will be briefer. To review, I've tried to highlight the different levels of living and how they bear upon our sense of life and flourishing, and thus also how we might correspondingly correspondingly think about danger in general and dangerous ideas specifically. First, thinking about the vegetative life, we we attended to the notion of flourishing and malnourishment. The The ideas we consume are no less vital to our health than the food that we consume. Second, thinking about animal life, we attended to appetite, sense, and locomotion. Danger is about more than consumption. The second point recognized the complexity and desire, which compels us towards some things and away from others. Things that are dangerous require our careful attention, but they should not cause us to err from the path or be confused with the direction and source of life. 
In each of these cases, we began with the commonality with other forms of life, both vegetative and animal, but we also metaphorically moved beyond them. In this sense, the soul has always been our focus. In this last part, I'd merely like to be more explicit about this. If we perceive ideas as dangerous, this is only because we are rational creatures. Intellect is an essential part of how God has created us, and thus no less essential to our flourishing as a plant's ability to process nutrients or an animal's ability to seek and find food. We could, we could not hunger and thirst for righteousness if we were not first rational, willing creatures. So, on this final point, I have two modest principles, as well as one appeal. First, the soul, intellect, and will is fundamental to human flourishing, and we neglect it to our detriment. This is a modest point, especially in the history of Western thought, but it's no longer something that we can take for granted. Indeed, I suspect that the soul is at best a vague idea to many of us. It certainly was for me when I was your age, and indeed well into my graduate work. There's a reason for this. For centuries, our wider culture has attempted to diminish our uniqueness, to think ourselves more like other material parts of creation. We can affirm what is affirmed, and I have tried to do so. God has created us as material, embodied creatures. But in affirming this, we should not overlook what is often denied, namely that we do have a soul with unique capacity, capacities, and we are set apart from other living creatures. For centuries, the Christian tradition has spoken of humans as fundamentally constituted by a soul. This is not merely some amorphous part of ourselves that goes to heaven after we die, but rather the fundamental life principle that motivates everything that we know and do. If we are confused about our soul, which we seem to be as a culture, then this will inevitably lead to a floundering, malnourished, wandering human who restlessly and blindlessly seeks life in barren places. Second, the weaker our souls are, the more vulnerable we will be to ideas, not just those that we perceive as dangerous, but all ideas. This is the insight of my student who recognized that she was unable to discern the truth or falsity of her own beliefs or to weigh them against the beliefs of others. This, in my estimation, is the real danger of ideas, which is a failure of knowledge itself. And this brings me back to where we began, as well as my appeal. As a basic principle of this, pa a basic principle of this paper is that we can only understand danger in relation to life. Additionally, I have argued that human life fundamentally relates to the soul, intellect, and will. At the beginning, I also suggested that ideas are fundamental to education. This is why, because education is fundamentally about the soul. A flourishing life requires a well-formed mind. To be sure, a college degree is no vouchsafe for spiritual formation. But this is at least a place where that can happen and should happen. How you will be formed here in intellect and will ultimately lies in the course before you. And so as you think about your life, here at Dort and beyond, my modest, my modest appeal is simply this. Consider your souls. Thank you. Uh, I, I believe you are dismissed. <laughs>